Hello and welcome to Get Real with Ralph, where we talk about the business, cultural, and social issues of the day, nationally, in the region, in our local area. Today I have some very exciting guests, and we have some topics of conversation that should be pretty interesting. We have with us here, uh, to the left, Dr. Peter Mariani. He is a local physician. We have David Mariani from Most Performance. As you know, he's been a regular on our show. And in addition to being a health and wellness specialist, he also is the son of a doctor, uh, Dr. Mariani here. And we have with us Joya Santarelli, who is uh, by trade an attorney, but is probably more well known for her running the Miss Kenosha pageant, being a former Miss Wisconsin, being a former Miss Kenosha, and has some opinions on the things going on in that arena that we'd like to weigh in on. So we're going to start today with medicine. How does that sound? That sounds good. Uh, I was going to spin a little dial, but I don't have one. And one of the things that, one of the issues that I think is becoming a, a, a bigger deal in medicine, and I, I, from what I understand this is an issue for you, is people of faith practicing medicine in an increasingly secular medical community. And so I'd like to get your, your thoughts on, on the challenges that physicians are facing on an increasing level uh, with, with the moral dilemmas that come as a result of that. <clears throat> well, uh, it, it, throughout the history of medicine, you've always had uh, people of faith practicing medicine and, sure. pe and, pe and people in the secular realm uh, uh, practicing medicine. So it's not something new. Uh, <clears throat> uh, Conflicts are beginning to rise more as technology increases and we can extend life. Uh, the ethical dilemmas come into play, such as uh, is, do we prolong life? Uh, do we prolong suffering? Does, does a doctor uh, have the right to terminate life? Uh, and uh, this is nothing, something new to the United States. It's been around in Europe, uh, kicked around a long time. and. Uh, uh, Active euthanasia, for example, is practiced in Holland. Uh, <clears throat> so it's not something uh, that's uh, uh, relatively new. Uh, uh, the issue of abortion is also uh, an ethical uh, consideration. Uh, now, the first man of faith, the first uh, f uh, uh, physician that we call the father of medicine was Hippocrates. And if the Hippocratic Oath, it clearly states that a physician should not administer and abortificant. Uh, now, uh, in my times, every physician, when he graduated from medical school, took that oath. But after uh, Roe versus, Ro versus Wade was passed in 1973, the physicians were at a loss on what to do with the Hippocratic, uh, what to do with the Hippocratic oath, and so they chose just to say, "Okay, we'll just eliminate it, and the phys graduating physicians won't have to take that oath anymore." To allow for uh, to allow for abortions, so uh, <clears throat> that ethical dilemma has always existed. It's probably getting uh, more n notoriety as we uh, as we tackle issues such as euthanasia. Uh, abortion has always been an issue since 1973. Uh, 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 transgender transgender changing sexes. Uh, these these issues uh, were unknown. Uh, in, uh, in the early history of medicine, but sure. are becoming more uh, prevalent and more talked about now. Do you think that, do you think that faith changes as technology changes? Uh, and is that a scary thing? Well, it, it, it does, because many people have different types of faith. Uh, you know, uh, uh, I think humanism uh, has always been uh, uh, prevalent in our society. Uh, uh, the book of Genesis says God created man in his image, and ever since then, man has been trying to return the favor. Sure. So uh, it's <laughs> it's it's something it's something that it's always always been uh, prevalent. But uh, 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 after the rise of uh, uh, monotheism with uh, 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 Judaism, mm -hmm. Christianity came in, and then there were various branches that came out of Christianity: the Reformation, Protestantism. Uh, 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 Jehovah's Witness, uh, the Church of Latter-day Saints, etc. Sure. Uh, <clears throat> so faith uh, has increased. It may have may not be to the, the Judeo-Christian faith, but uh, different types of faith. Uh, and uh, 
Uh, I think the, what's more prevalent now is uh, what I call an independent faith or humanism, where we're, we're entitled uh, to uh, uh, to uh, prof uh, to do our own destiny, you know, in effect, and not rely on scripture. Sure. What do you think are the biggest issues in 2018 right now? What what, what, are, what are the issues? In, in, like you said, there has been this diabolical opposition between science and, and, and religion for a very long time. And then there's always the people that are trying to reconcile the two. I, I consider myself one of those people. I'm always trying to reconcile the two. You know, when I hear seven days, I don't think seven days in, 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 in our way. I, I, I have some opinions that some people might think are out there, but I believe that if, for example, if, if we're to assume that Jesus is real, and I believe that, and the Son of Man spoke, or the Son of God spoke in parables, then maybe God spoke in parables too in the Old Testament. That's some of the thoughts that go through my head. And when science disproves things, I say, well, that doesn't mean that the, the story is less relevant. It means that perhaps maybe God was explaining a story in a way that people understood uh, or that they could understand it the same way you would uh, use a, a fable for a, a child to make them understand a lesson, and that doesn't make it any less relevant. And, you know, I think people that have a stronger orthodoxy and faith would, would challenge me on that and say that that's absolutely wrong and that you have to take everything literally word by word. I, I just don't. But that doesn't mean that I have any less faith. But when medicine and science start showing you things that you didn't already know, uh, and in many ways it is proving the existence as much as it's, it's proving something's false. It's, improved, it's proving the existence of a soul, which I think that uh, people are, are very interested in knowing. You know, do we have a soul? Where does our soul go? And all of that. But with this modern technology, are there new challenges for you now that you didn't see earlier on? Uh, things that you feel that people in the medical profession are going to be at a stronger moral dilemma where they're going to be forced to by big big hospitals, big insurance companies to either not do things or to do things that really go against their, their beliefs and what's best not only for the patient but also uh, in, in line with their faith. Well, <clears throat> the uh, uh, practice of medicine has become less uh, independent as uh, third-party payers uh, come into the uh, picture uh, with insurance companies paying for the hospital uh, uh, and to physician fees, F physicians have less uh, authority in making in making healthcare decisions for their patients. Making a healthcare decision, sure. So it becomes more difficult, particularly when you tell a patient that in order to survive, you need uh, bypass uh, surgery, for example, and the patient is ninety plus years old. Now, up to this point, insurance companies have allowed some of these things, but uh, I foresee that in the future, as the costs of medicine continue to rise insurance companies may get more uh, more restringent on what they allow so, uh, so that a physician is caught between the dilemma of, of proposing that to a patient uh, or uh, not saying anything to a patient and not performing the procedure. Uh, he has to work through a hospital, so the hospital has expenses too as well. Uh, so it's not as simple as it was uh, uh, when I was a boy of uh, uh, 60 years ago. I think insurance has completely ruined the healthcare industry, and I would argue that if insurance had never been invented, healthcare would be a hell of a lot cheaper because then you were just making a buying decision on your healthcare product because it's a product like anything else based on what you had in your pocket. And yes, there were severe situations where, where that isn't going to work out for everybody, but in general, as soon as he got the government involved with Medicare and then private insurance companies, and they started making all these deals with, with providers, it ended up making the cost rise for people that don't have insurance more than the people that do. Correct. For example, they'll negotiate a, a, a medicine and get the, the cost down to $10 for you if you have insurance and you pay the $10 copay. But really, the, the pharmacy is only getting $10. But yet, if you go in there without insurance and you buy that same that same drug, you're going to pay $60, 70 $80 for it. And I, I think it's a scam, and I, I think it's terrible. One of the things that I've seen that I think is a good thing is the, the emergence of these faith-based cost-sharing programs, Christian Health Ministries, so on and so forth, where they're not considered insurance. And they, they don't cover pre-existing conditions, which I understand. I understand both sides of that argument. I mean, who buys car insurance after you got in an accident and says, fix my car for me? 
you haven't contributed to that pool. So that's part of it. But the billing gets done after the fact, and the, these cost-sharing pools that you contribute to aren't making your decisions for you the way insurance companies are. Have you encountered patients using that, that style of uh, health care coverage? No, I haven't. Have you heard of, have you heard of it? Yes, yeah. I've heard of it, but I haven't. I, I've been reading up a lot on it. I'm actually <laughs> considering doing it myself because my wife is in education, and I'd like her to come back to the private sector with me, and obviously that, that's a big concern. Yeah. And uh, you know, you're self-employed. You know, it's yep. like you, you you are you're, you're a self-employed family. Yes. So you know, buying health insurance is getting harder and harder. You know, there's there's been nothing affordable about the Affordable Health Care Act. If you are a family with kids and you're young and you're healthy and your insurance used to be cheap, but now they've raised your premium to cover the people that are less healthy because they're older and they have pre-existing conditions. Yeah, that's a win for them, but it's, it's a loss for everybody who's been responsible their, their whole life and, and bought insurance. Yeah. And it makes sense, Ralph, if, if you have a direct payment to a physician uh, or to the hospital, and then you involve insurance in there, you know the cost of healthcare is going to go up. Do you think there'll be a disruptor like there has in other industries like Uber or Black or Netflix? Do you think there'll be a disruptor in healthcare where there's going to be a straight to consumer, we don't take insurance uh, type of of well, cottage there, industry? Well, there's some physicians that practice that way that sure. that take straight a payment, uh, or they take a certain amount per year, yep. and then they accept Medicare and they guarantee complete coverage to that patient for the one year. Gotcha. Uh, I don't know about hospitals, though. I don't know if they participate in that. Uh, <clears throat> but it makes sense any time you involve more people in the delivery of health care, the health care is going to go up. But insurance company... More people have to get paid. No, well, they, people, yeah. They're not in there for their health. When you, start insurance, when you start an insurance company, people have to administer that insurance right. plan. Right. That means that at the end of the day, it's going to cost the insurance company more money to pay your doctor than it would have cost you to pay your doctor. Correct. There's, just, there's just no way around. Correct. And See, in Europe, uh, after the Second World War, uh, Europe, European nations realized that they had a health care crisis. We didn't quite realize that because we were an emergent nation right. at that time. Uh, we had just come out of a big depression, and the Second World War had actually helped us get out of that depression. Sure. But in Europe, they, they, they were dealing with this for centuries, and they realized that the cost of health care was going up, and m mostly all of the European countries adopted socialized medicine. Just correct. And uh, where the health care was rationed uh, and the government uh, was responsible for the uh, payment of health care. And uh, but likewise, the government also paid for the education of physicians. Uh, the physician went to medical school without any cost to himself, uh, but he was obliged to work for the government and he was paid according to their charts. Sure. Lawyers were taken out of the, out of the mix. There was no uh, malpractice suits. Hey, anytime we can get rid of the lawyers, right? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> they, they were taken out of the mix and you say, well, how do they do the amount? Well, they were, done by a, they were done by a council where you had physicians and the lay people sit there. And uh, if the physician, if the surgeon, for example, took off the wrong foot at surgery, they looked at the person's age, they looked at his occupation, they looked at his, looked at his uh, earnings, uh, and they just had a static amount. This they, is, had, this, they, this, they had charts. This they, is what a bad. This is what taking the wrong leg is worth. This is what it's worth to you. It's worth something different to a different person. But they had charts for this, and there was no arbitration. And then the physician was punished. You know, was reprimanded, and if he continued uh, to practice in that manner, he would uh, suffer a possible loss of his license. Now, we haven't adopted that system because we came out of the Second World War very wealthy. And matter of fact, through the Marshall Plan, uh, we supported Europe. Right. You know, you, yeah, our, we, our, we, our wealth we, rebuilt their country and ours. We rebuilt the yeah. European country. Yeah, we yeah. sure did. And, uh, so they could they could afford socialized medicine because we we're building everything for them. Correct. Right. Now, so and we didn't need it at that time, but now no, I think, oh, and, and you said, what are the challenges? I think that sh that would be a big challenge, uh, because you have you have insurance companies that are trying to make money. Uh, you have the health care costs that are rising. Technology is increasing. We can do more for patients, but that comes at a cost. Yeah. Uh, and who's going to pay for that? If a 90-year-old person uh, who has a marginal life expectancy and has marginal health care wants to have coronary bypass, according to our system, he can. Right. Medicare will pay for it. Right. I think in the future... As our, as the uh, you're going to get turned down because you just passed a certain age. Well, the government has to do something about it. Yeah, you know, the government's going to have to. And, and and then we go back to faith. Are you doing the right? And that's where it really becomes 
a, a moral dilemma is you have a perfectly healthy 85 year old who's in great health in every other way but because they don't fit that matrix yeah. we're not going to do that procedure but maybe they have 15 more years whereas the next 85 year old has everything else wrong with them and they only have two left mm -hmm. how do you how do you how do you make that decision i mean i can i have a hard time making that decision with my dog mm -hmm. how do you make the decision with a human being and i think that that's the, the question that we leave lingering that it, it, is going to remain unresolved. Uh, uh, Medicaid, or uh, they apply for Medicaid immediately, so we can offer that person, uh, uh, you know, uh, health care. The only, the only issue I struggle with is, am I doing the right thing for the person? Am I prolonging his suffering when I know the ultimate outcome? And being honest with the patient and with the family is always the right thing to do. Sure. But sometimes people don't uh, uh, don't listen to doctors as they did years ago. They're making largely emotional decisions, emotional decisions based on partial information they got off the internet, and you know, reading reading Web, WebMD does not a doctor make. I mean, Correct. that's just Correct. And so and and social f family problems too. You know, uh, mom mom has been in the nursing home for ten years. We haven't taken care of her, but now she's dying on the ventilator. We want everything done. Right. Yeah. You know, so you have those issues too that that you know that come into play. So I've not had to deal with you know with giving uh, health care, but I think in the future, as the, as the cost of health care goes up, that's going to become a real problem. Real problem because because right now we have a system in which uh, insurances are paying doctors, Medicare are paying doctors based on what they feel doctors should get, but a doctor. To become a doctor is solely his responsibility. Completely, yeah. My, my, my brother-in-law is in his second year of med school in, in Columbus in a DO program right now, and it's it's not an easy task. Not an easy task. And I think that is probably a harder task now, and the payoff is, and the reward is lower. Yeah, you, you, you have to be doing it for the love of doing it. Correct. You know, the, the, you know, back in the 70s and 80s, let's grow up, be a doctor, make a lot of money, and I don't think that that's really the thought process anymore. And if, if it is, that you're, you're totally getting in for the wrong reasons. We're going to take a break, and when we come back, we're going to talk uh, about cultural changes going on in other parts of our country, such as the new change this year, Miss America is losing the swimsuit. So we'll cover that in the next se segment of Get Real. Okay, so here we are in the studio on Get Real with Ralph, and we just got done talking with Dr. Peter Mariani about ethics, Christianity, and medicine and how they all are intertwined, and uh, it's, it's been an interesting conversation. I definitely want to pick up on that uh, on, on, on future, on, on future right. episodes because there's, so there's so much there. Oh, yes. Uh, we have Joya Santarelli with us today, who is the executive director of the Miss Kenosha pageant. Uh, which is uh, something very near and dear to her heart because she started off as a contestant, which is kind of a family tradition. She was the second member of her immediate family to be a Miss Kenosha. She's the second person named Joya to be a Miss Kenosha, and she was also Miss Wisconsin back in, what year was that? 2000. 2000. And now you're directing, you're an attorney by trade, but you're not practicing while you're practicing, taking care of your kids and supporting the family business and all of that, plus yes. plus doing all of this. How's that going so far this year? The pageant? Yeah. It's going well. Yeah. Um, we're having it on February 9th okay. at St. Joe's. And um, usually, I don't know how much you've kept up with it, but we've had about, we have between three to 500 people that attend every year. And I think ever since Laura Kepler became Miss America, America, it's it's really uh, made people more interested in it. Yeah, yeah. she she was good for the brand. She yes. was definitely good for the brand locally, and such a nice person too. Yes. And easy to, very approachable, which is unusual, I think, in that realm. There there been some changes in Miss America this year, and they've shed the swimsuit. No more swimsuit competition, huh? They have. Well, it's interesting, though, because we still have it on the local level. Okay. So at, if you come to the Miss Kenosha pageant, there will be a swimsuit competition. Perfect. But at Miss Wisconsin, there is no swimsuit. At Miss America, no swimsuit. Gotcha. And no evening gown, either. No evening gown, either? No. I, they, so has it become basically another America's Got Talent or another American Idol? What separates a pageant 
from a talent competition if you don't have the pageantry type of activities uh, happening there? Well, the main points behind this whole movement, um, whether you agree or disagree, is they want to they want to make it more uh, appealable, I guess, to everyone. They want to make Miss, the Miss America organization something where anyone can get involved and they don't have to feel as though they have to fit a certain body type or look a certain way. So it's almost in the mentality of everyone deserves a trophy type of thing. Yeah. And I personally feel And like it takes a lot of work. Let, let's face it, it takes a lot of work. Now, don't get me wrong. You have people with different body types that are absolutely stunningly beautiful. And I'm not one of those that believes that, you know, if you're not a size zero, you're not gorgeous. I think that that's, that, that, that mentality is flawed. That being said, there is a lot of self-discipline and work that goes into looking good. You're not just born looking good in a swimsuit. Nobody is. It is like being a bodybuilder. It's just a different kind of bodybuilding. You have to have the right diet. Uh, Dave, you, you, you help people with diet and exercise yeah. for a living. Yeah. Uh, have you worked with anybody who's doing talent competitions or panels? Yeah, I actually had a chance to work with Laura before her Miss America. So after Miss Wisconsin, before Miss America, we went to Carthage together and... Uh, um, she reached out to me because she knew that I was training people, so I helped her with that. Um, and there definitely is a little more challenge with that than an athlete, because an athlete, it's just basically strictly performance, whereas um, with Laura, it was uh, how it looks. Well, bo bodybuilders, I would say. Right. I, I, I would say it's closer to bodybuilders, or now they have the right. physique competitions, which are not full-out bodybuilding, but it's yeah. all about how you look in the And I haven't really spent too much time with bodybuilders. Um, outside of Aaron Clark was one of my close friends at Cedar Road, my first school, and he kind of helped me get started with the training. Um, basically, it's been athletes, not bodybuilders. Um, so Laura was probably one of the few that I've taken that wasn't, um, I guess, technically an athlete. You could make the argument that everybody's an athlete, but yeah, um, yeah she is more strictly uh, how it looks, not necessarily how it functions. Yeah. But there is something to be said about how it functions and how it looks, and they go together more than people probably realize. But um, yeah, it was, it, it was enjoyable. It was trying at times. I, I know that the, when we first started, she came in with a couple pictures, um, and they, they were past winners, and it was swimsuit pictures. And there was, um, she came in with, with ideas of what she wanted, and there was a, um, some type of expectation, which is good. But at the same time, um, Miss America, it, from what I understand, is more um, about having a platform and not just about having looks, which I think that's the Miss sure. USA. I think Miss USA is more about the looks. You're right. You yeah. got it. Got it. So, you, you, but it's the whole pack. It, it should be the whole package. And this is just my, and maybe I'm not qualified to talk about this because I'm a man. I don't know. But I think that, first of all, there was too much emphasis on being a zero, you know, size zero or size one, and not everybody has that body type. And I think there are some people that have broken that mold well, in I general. I agree with you, though, because it's not about um, who's the skinniest, whoever's the skinniest right. is going to get the most points. It's right. more about being fit and toned. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not about being a size zero. Sure. I'm just saying, the orth but the orthodoxy, there are certain people involved in that, that that's their mindset, that that's what they think is fit. Not the general public, but I would say in any organization, in any profession, you have those people that are kind of the elite who think they make policy even if they don't sure and the mindset was always oh girl you're fat you gotta you, you gotta trim off and maybe that was the case in some cases and maybe it was that she was off of where her actual her particular goal was if that's your goal that's great uh, you know you should be able to do that do you think it's but having that discipline putting that work in having being fit like you said in general is a good thing and I think that it was a, a central part of, of the competition because it involves self-discipline. For sure. I mean... And self-discipline is what it takes to be successful. Yes, but like when you compete in this pageant, the way it used to be is you had to have a talent and it couldn't just be some run-of-the-mill thing. I mean, you had to be very talented and you had to be very disciplined in your talent, whatever it was. So that had to be... You had to spend a lot of time with that. As David said, you had a platform. Right. And that requires... A lot of time a lot of public speaking um, developing your program whatever it may be yeah then you have the evening gown competition which you know there's not too too much with that but no. it's still not that easy to get up there and, and well, that's it. gotta be I, I gotta say if I had to get up in an evening gown well that's a, <laughs> that's a different subject we'll talk about sure no, no. but if I <laughs> had to get up if I had to get up there in a speedo 
I don't, I don't know if I could do that. That's, that takes, and I'll get up and sing in front of people and some people are scared to death to do sure. that. So everybody you know, has four there. different parts that you need to be an expert in all of them. And for me personally, the swimsuit was the hardest part because, um, it's the most subjective. No, I mean, you, you had to spend hours really, I, I don't want to say in a gym, but I guess yeah, working training. on your fitness. Yeah, you had to train. And it was not, it's not easy. You know, it's not easy. It's basically, you have to be an athlete on top of everything else, even if you're not, you even if you're not a competitive athlete in other sports. So now they took it out of it and because they want everyone to have a chance. So how are they addressing fit? Well, everybody has a chance to be fit. I agree. Not, I mean, and the thing is, um, not everyone's able to be on the New York Yankees, right? Correct. That's the way. Not they're... everybody is going to be Miss America. Nope. And not, you know, not everybody is going to be a world class brain surgeon. That's not everybody true. is going, you know, everybody, this notion that you have to be, I have to be good or recognized for what you're good at because otherwise I don't feel equal to you yeah. instead of focusing on I want to be my best version of me. I yeah. think that that's, I think that this is helping, this, this is helping that narrative that it's not fair that somebody else is better at something than me. And, and, I, and I don't like that narrative because if anybody looks within, they're going to find, you, you might look like the elephant man, but you might be gifted at something and you might be able to get up and speak. You might be able to make people laugh and that's something that a better looking person or a more fit person can do. You might be able to play the piano better than anybody else, play the violin. And yeah, you might be at a slight disadvantage on the swimsuit portion, but you're so badass on the violin sure. that people are going to overlook that. Or when you open up your mouth and sing, you know, you sound like Adele. Now, there's a good example. She probably couldn't win the Miss America pageant, but I am in love with her. I think she's just amazingly talented. She's absolutely stunningly beautiful. Does that make me... What, if I say, well, yeah, but Miss America really isn't your venue... Does that make me judgmental, or is that just being realist? I think it's just being realist. And do you think it's going to continue, or do you, do you think that there'll be popular demand will make it come back? Oh, the whole organization is a mess right now, to be honest. So I don't know what's going to happen. They're about as messed up as the Boy Scouts. It's pretty bad. I just focus on. Do you call them Boy Scouts or Scouting? I'm sorry, <laughs> Scouting now. It's boy. So you have Girl Scouts and you have Scout. Can you explain this to me? Why is it that you have Girl Scouts and you have Scouting? Why can't you have Girl Scouts and Boy Scouts? I mean, is there, I, I know we just segued into another thing, but it's right. all interconnected. Can't boys be boys still? Can't girls be girls still? If they want to. If they want to be. At least if they want to. If they, they want to identify as boy or girl, I guess that's another issue. You know? I'm not touching that, because <laughs> this is only my third episode. And, you know, <laughs> I, I, but that I, goes into it, you know, that, that plays into it, you know. Yeah. Maybe. Because some of the Girl Scouts are going to want to do the scouting or the Boy Scouts now, and, and you're going to have to, you know, they have they to address that. But they had they had a forum for that, and you know I, I'm thinking from the standpoint of a father with daughters, I want my daughter to be involved in organizations that are all girls, all women, that are all you know all female, and have that bonding experience. Mm -hmm. And you don't get that in school. Schools are mostly co-ed. If not there, where? Where is where is your safe space? Because we're talking about safe spaces. To be a boy and do stupid shit that boys do and not have to worry about judgment from the opposite sex or same thing with girls. I mean, let's face it, girls, women are going to talk about things differently behind closed doors when there aren't any men around. Men are going to talk about things differently. Boys are going to talk about different things behind closed doors when the opposite sex isn't around. It's part of a, it's part of a coming of age as a kid yeah. and it's part of just you know, part of the human condition. And I don't understand why suddenly everybody has a problem with it. I just don't. It doesn't. It doesn't sit well with me. And you know, we, we talked about this last week because we were talking about the very serious issue of human trafficking. Mm -hmm. And the week before, we were talking about maybe it's cold outside and how people thought that yes. it sounded a little, you know, rapey because they weren't really looking at it in context of the time. And I think issues like this hurt actual victims of violence and hurt victims of sexual violence because you have this wolf crime going on mm -hmm. so much and there are so many serious issues that that are really the more i know about it it's near and dear to my heart that people are actually being victimized and yet you have people crying that they're victims and they're so loud and they're so out in front that the real victims are the ones that are hiding in the back so because they don't want to be identified they, they've actually experienced a traumatic event in their lives 
They didn't have some 17-year-old grab their butt when they were 17 in high school, and they're trying to stop them from getting a job at age 50. They've moved on with their lives. And it's, it's stunning to me how overly sensitive everybody is about non-issues and then how they ignore real issues. Real issues that are affecting real girls, being kidnapped, being held against their will, being raped, being you name it. And we're worried about this bullshit right here. And I think that I, I, there's got to be a time in our culture where we just kind of get it all straight. And we just kind of shake everything loose and say, okay, this is, this is nonsense. It's very scary as a mother of two boys when I think about them going to high school and college. Um, you've got to really watch yourself. You tell your, it's it's almost the opposite of the way it used to be. You used to tell your girls, make sure that you yeah. keep it all closed up so you get married. Well, now I think you have to tell your boys that. Honestly. Because your boys will go to jail for it. Yes. Even if they did, you know, even if it was completely consensual that night and the next morning there's some regret going on. And there was an entire special on 60 Minutes about how they were using Title IX to force boys out of schools with no legal hearing, no representation, just based on... The next day, she had a problem with it. And you know what? We've all been 19 and 20 and drinking and hormones are flying around and probably have done some things, at least on some level, that we look back and go, boy, I wouldn't do that again. But to think that you could have the next day ruined somebody else's life over it is, is a pretty scary thing. And boy, we, we, we veered way off, but that's what Get Real is all about. Uh, because it, it's all connected. It's this, this hypersensitivity to everything. I think it's going to fail. I think that taking the swimsuit out, taking the evening gown out is going to plummet their viewership and they think that they're doing something cool and politically correct and, and all of that. But at the end of the day, it's about dollars and people vote with their dollars, people vote with their eyeballs and they decide what they're going to tune into. And when they decide that this is just so boring now that there's no reason to watch it anymore, then it's going to go away because like I said, there's nothing setting it apart now from American Idol or The X Factor, America's Got Talent or The Voice or any of these other shows that are that are more talent focused. Very true. This was supposed to be this girl's the whole package, girl next door, physically disciplined, mentally disciplined, has a talent, and I think that's what people want. And I don't subscribe to the idea that it's just a bunch of dirty old men that want to see girls in swimsuits. I don't think that at all. You know, I, I see a 19 year old in a swimsuit, I see a child. I don't see, I, I don't see it in the same way that I saw it when I was 19. And I'm sure that not every guy out there is like that. But I think for the most part, people still have a sense of decency deep down, even though their, their senses of humor may not reflect that. I think when it comes to what they actually do in their lives and, and what they support, yeah, most people still have, that, have those, those boundaries of decency. Mm -hmm. Well, when we come back, we are going to do a little Christmas trivia and keep it fun. So we're going to cut this segment. I don't know if we're going to have Joy with us or not because she's got to get real and go get her kids. <laughs> so uh, we'll come back and we'll have a little Christmas fun and tune in next week for the New Year's special where we're going to talk about some of the biggest issues of 2018 that you didn't hear about on Get Real with Ralph. Well, we're back, and it is Christmas Eve coming here soon. As a matter of fact, if you're watching this, it's probably Christmas Eve right now if you're watching for the first time. And I got a couple of bottles of wine to give to our guests. Compliments of Fausto Fioravanti over at Avanti Brothers Wine. I told him that I needed some wine to uh, give my guests as gifts, and he said, no problem. And he came and just dropped them right off. And uh, I tried, he said, it's on me, they need to taste this wine. So. Hopefully you like the wine. So that's the story behind the wine sitting here. So we're gonna play Christmas trivia and I don't have any fancy buzzers or anything. So I'm gonna throw out a question. Everybody throws up their hand. Whoever throws up their hand first, you guess it. If you guess wrong, then I'm gonna go on to the next person and see if they get a chance to steal your answer. So the first one is, who is the star of the Christmas movie, Jingle All the Way? Arnold Schwarzenegger. Ding, 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 ding. You got to put the ding, ding, ding there in the post-production, too. And you got to get me saying you got to put it in there. That way people know that it was my idea. All right. Get your first pick. You got Pino, Cab. Right here. All right. <laughs> All right. How awesome. I know. I love it. I got 
Yeah, see, there's one that I wanted to ask and I got to try. And I got one that's not even up here. What city and state did Kevin McAllister live in? Same. Oh. Chicago, Illinois. Nope. When I came on. Too late. <laughs> <laughs> you get to the guess now. Uh, yeah, that, that would my my guess would have been Chicago. So I guess it would be Winnetka. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Thank you. Joya won you a bottle of wine. How do you like that? Pick one. <laughs> All yeah, right. Kenosha Kickers on there, I think, right? The, yes. The, yes, the Kenosha yeah. Kickers. I love that. Oh. Oh, John Candy. All right. And let's go back a little further to Frank Capra's It's a Wonderful Life. What song was Jimmy Stewart's character? Um, oh my gosh, I did, my brain just. What what song did George Bailey and Mary sing when they were walking home from her graduation? Do you know? By the light of silver and moon. Close. Buffalo and Gals, Gals, can't you come out yeah, tonight? Can't you come out song. tonight? Can't you come out tonight? All right. <laughs> Merlot and Pinot. You're going to take home two, aren't you? And I'm going to give a participation trophy to Dr. Mariani. <laughs> he's too busy studying medicine to, to, to be up on all this trivial bullshit, right? No, but I did see one for life. So <laughs> Here, take a you know, picture. I was going to watch that movie a lot growing up. I I, we watch it every year when we decorate our tree. Yeah. So my, my wife always makes cookies the same night we decorate the tree, and we always get a real one still. And I always put it on. We don't really sit and watch watch it anymore right. because we've yeah. seen it so many times. But that's got to be on to the point that my 19-year-old, my 18-year-old came over uh, while we were decorating the tree. And they, they said, hey, we're, how come It's a Wonderful Life isn't on? Like they were almost Aww. scarred that I didn't have it on. I said, okay. And I, I don't think that was, I don't think I tried to set it up as a tradition. It's just, hey, let's put this on. And so we always put, we always put on It's a Wonderful Life when we're decorating the tree. I got a funny story about that. I fell asleep one time to It's a Wonderful Life when I had it on DVD when I lived on Cooper Road. And the Buffalo Gals part just kept looping over and over again, the background music, in my head for like nine hours while I slept and I was really tired and I woke up still hearing it. And it was, I was having dreams about that song. I mean, it was, it almost became a night and I love that movie. I got over it by like the next Christmas. But it was, the strangest thing is here, da 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 over and over and over and over again. Well, that wraps us up for today. I want everybody at home to have a Merry Christmas. I want you guys all to have a Merry Christmas. I hope I hope you come back again because it was a lot of fun. I would love to. I hope you'll come back again. I know you're gonna be back again because we're on a regular thing. But uh this is this has been fun and we're growing a little bit every week audience wise I'm growing a little bit and figuring out how to actually do this because I have no clue what I'm doing <laughs> and uh, that's you know that's the fun of it so tune in next week we're gonna talk about the biggest stories of 2018 that you've never heard about have a Merry Christmas I'm Ralph Nudie and this is get real with Ralph